Okay, talking about viscosity. Let's see. So continuing, viscosity. How do we figure out viscosity? It is tested with a Sabolt. Say what? S-A-Y-B-O-L-T. Sabolt Universal Viscometer. V-I-S-C-O-S-I-M-E-T-E-R. I guess that would be S-U-V for short. I just thought of that. All right, so here's what's weird, though, is we have aviation, the aviation grade, and the SAE. SAE is Society of Automotive Engineers. So you go down to the store, and what kind of oil you put in your car? Somebody. SAE. The stuff that burns the... Five Give w me a number. <laughs> Five what? Five W20. Yeah. Five W20. I don't have that one. But yeah, so you're going to use something very different than aviation oil. So aviation oil, we'd call it 65. Automotive would call it 30 weight. I don't know why they did that. We have, I've, and I've never seen 65. I, I don't know. I've seen SA30. I mean, that's, that's very common. All right, but 80 would be very common for us. 80 weight, that would be SAE 40. Um, 100. So 80 and 100 are the two most common grades of oil that we're going to be dealing with. Rare to go on either side of that. I said I've never seen 65. Guess what SAE that is? 55. 50. It's just one half except for the 60. Um, we do have aviation grade 120, which would not be that rare. That would be radials. Radial engines use 120. That would be SAE... 60. 60, you got it. And I've never seen 140, but apparently it's there, which would be SAE 70, which I've also never seen. So SAE, what would be normal SAE? Well, normal would be 30, 30 and 40, really, right? Like 20. They, yeah. yeah, I guess 20W50. Oh, uh, well. Yeah, but not straight weight 50. I don't know, so it's kind of maybe sort of 50, I don't know. All right. So first of all, so that is that. So remember, when I'm talking about 80 or 100 weight, it's not like I'm talking about, oh, my gosh, that is so thick. I'm really talking 40 and 50 weight if you're thinking cars. I don't know what the oil of my car sounds like. I don't know. Is that, would that be the set? Like, yeah. like my oil is like 5W20. You're talking about the 20. Like yeah, and we're going to talk about the multi-grades in just a, just a minute here. I hope. Better. Or maybe not a minute. In a couple days. That's a bit confusing. I'm like, well, what is it? The second number? We're getting there. Well, okay, just so you know, the uh, it's it's a little different. But in in your oils, like I talked a little bit ago about 15W50, when I talked about the semi-synthetic somewhere? Yeah. 15W50, the 20W50. Okay, so when it's cold, it acts like it's the first number. Okay. When it's hot, it acts like the second number. So that's the whole point of a multi-viscosity is when the oil is really cold and it has a very high viscosity, it doesn't want to flow well. And so if you can get it to flow much easier at a cold temperature thus the 15 or 20, then when it heats up, you don't want this really thin oil. You want something thicker, which would be your 50. Uh, my father-in-law, he's a fun guy. Um, he's still around. Um, I was going to say you should meet him. Um, but we, he loves talking about this kind of stuff for batteries. He gets all excited. Oh, you're talking about oil? Oh, man, I love talking about oil. He does. And uh, he has this great analogy where he talks about... Um, you know, because I like to think about oil, it, it, the, the viscosity is ball bearing size. You know, because if you think about it, you got, you know, your engine crankshaft inside of uh, these bearings. And you don't want it rubbing on those bearings. You want like little ball bearings inside of there, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you have your engine that you built. You have a plain bearing inside of a, and a crankshaft inside and you need oil in there, right? It's, it's whole design was so that the, the crankshaft is never really touching this. There's a layer of oil in there, and that's what it touches. That's why it's pressure-fed in there to 
produce oil, and that oil acts like little tiny microscopic ball bearings running around in there. Follow? Yeah. And so what he says, you know, if you, I like, he said, I like to think about the fact in like 20 weight oil, it's very, very tiny little ball bearings, but 50 weight oil is like twice the size. And if you take that little analogy, it starts to make sense. When the engine is cold, right, everything is tight and together, clearances aren't so big. But as it heats up, everything gets bigger, including the clearances. So when it's really tightened together, do you want to be shoving ball bearings through that little tiny itty bitty space? Nah, you want something that fits, so you need little ball bearings. But then once it heats up and expands, you have all of the space while not slopping around in there. Well, you want big ball bearings in there to take up the size. So you can look at a multi-weight in that respect. So, all right, so tested with a Sabolt Universal Visco Viscosometer, or an SUV, and it is based upon how long it takes 60 cubic centimeters or cc's, if you will, to flow at a given temp. And that given temp, because I know you're going to ask, is at 100 degrees, 130, and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So why we're doing cc's in Fahrenheit, I don't know, through an orifice. Orifice is a small hole. This is made by a Brit. Yeah, I know, yeah, the mixture. These readings or readings are then given a number, which is the number we just looked at. Sense. Let's skip it. It's a building. Someone's still in Black Rock. Uh, typically, uh, typically with colding the environment, the does that make sense? Yeah. Typically, the lower the environment. The lower the viscosity number, that would make more sense. Desired. So in other words, if I had to choose one of these oils right here, because we're over the aviation side, and I said, hey, I'm going to be taking a trip up to Alaska this week and I'm doing an oil change, which oil would you recommend I use? If these were the only choices you had. 80, 65. Yeah, probably 65. Okay, you better find some 65 for that engine. Uh, but 80, right? If I'm gonna go colder environment, actually, if I was gonna do something in Alaska, I'd, I definitely want a multi-viscosity. Uh, in the summer, flying around here, what do I want? 100. 100, yeah. So lower the environment, the lower the viscosity number desired, and uh, the higher the temp, higher the number desired. So we talk about cold operation. I've heard people in Alaska, I mean, you guys ever watch those shows about flying in Alaska and stuff? Yeah, like Buffalo Airlines or something. Something like that, yeah. You know, and I listen to podcasts where people talk about flying in Alaska. And what they do is, you know, they, at the flight, last flight of the day, they stop, get out, pop the oil, put it in a, put it in a container, and they take it in the cabin with them, set it on the stove overnight. Can't leave it out there at night because the stuff practically freezes or maybe does freeze. Uh, so, yeah? I just had a question yeah. to clarify. So the lower the temp, the lower the viscosity number, which means that it needs more water? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, so, let me see. Some older aircraft. I don't think they have it anymore is why I say older aircraft. Um, but I think they had it around. I, don't know, like I think our 310 out there has this system on it. Uh, some older aircraft were equipped with oil dilution systems. To that doesn't make any sense that I wrote. Some older aircraft dilution systems to counter the higher temps needed. I see what I was trying to say, but I'm saying some older equipped oil dilution systems too. Um, I don't want to say this. That's the problem. To help uh, decrease decrease. Viscosity. To help decrease viscosity of oil for cold weather operations. Cold weather ops. So what this is, um, the dilution system would literally pump gasoline. Dilution that's why is T E the system would um, it's a manual, it's not operation, you just have to push a button. Um, would inject av gas into the oil at shutdown. So as you shut your engine down. I think you'd have to keep it running. I've never read the P operation on this in practical, but it doesn't make sense. You wouldn't be able just to inject it, shut the engine down and inject it. That wouldn't make sense, but you'd let the engine cool down. You'd have to let it cool. Uh, and then you would inject oil, gasoline into the oil system. So the gasoline and oil would mix and it would make the oil lower viscosity. Lower viscosity. And then what happens in the morning, you would come out, start up the engine. You have this thin oil gasoline mixture, mind you, full of lead. Uh, and gosh, the more I think about it, the more awful it is. Because when I sent out my oil for oil analysis, it's one of the things they look for is lead. And if you have a lot of lead, they're like, oh, you better, you know, do you have a uh, fuel leak into the oil? Um, you're running too rich. You know, it's all these things. So it's like, oh, no, I just have an oil dilution system. Um, so anyway... You start up the aircraft, and as the aircraft warms up and you fly, the temperature inside of the engine is above the evaporation point of aviation fuels. So the fuel is going to evaporate like it would if you're going to use it and go out the breather, except for the heavy metals left behind, and then you'll be left with undiluted oil. Then you repeat and repeat, and yeah, like I said, man, that'd be a lot of, that'd be nasty. I haven't really thought about how nasty that would be, but... It would be. Um, yes. Sounds like a nut. hitting them all. So it just uh, add gas and the oil at shutdown um, at operating temp. Operating temps. The fuel. Oops. Would evaporate. Would evaporate. Um, if dilution system leaks, so I think this is a Q and A, um, fuel gets into oil. What would that happen if you have a dilution valve? Because you're going to have a valve that's electrically operated. And when you press a button, it's going to open a valve and fuel under pressure is then going to bypass, go into the carburetor fuel injection system and be diverted into the oil tank. So what is that going to ultimately cause if that's constantly leaking while you're flying? Pressure, boom. We cause, say it again. Low pressure. Okay. Um, higher viscosity. Yes. Or again, the oil will cause um, low oil pressure. 
If you have low oil pressure, then that means that you're going to have poor lubrication. Poor lubrication means friction, which means what will happen to the oil that is going through there. Uh, just the temperature going to go high. So I want my temperature oil temp. Ideal oil temp would be about 180 degrees F. So we get up into the 200 degree range. It's getting pretty freaking hot. You don't want that. So it doesn't, it's not going to coke at 200 degrees F, but it's starting to get really hot, 210, 220. Not a good idea. So you're way away from coking, but you're too hot. I wrote this down. I think it might be a Q&A question. That there's a reason why I did it. Fuel line for dilution is never part of pressure system. What I mean by that is if you have a fuel injection system on your aircraft or a low wing, you're going to have pressure. Well, even if you have a high wing, you have pressure. So let's just say we have a fuel injected engine. We're going to have a, a fuel pump in the fuel tank that is a centrifugal pump. It's a non constant displacement. So we can just spin, and if nothing's being used, it's not going to blow up. It just spins, puts pressure in the line. The line goes, pressure goes down the line until it gets to an, a fuel strainer. Then it's going to go from a fuel strainer to an engine driven fuel pump that could be constant displacement. It doesn't have to be. Then from there, it's going to go to the fuel servo unit. So everything I mentioned is this line going to the fuel injection system. Nowhere was that line part of the dilution system. To get to the dilution system, you would have to have um, another line coming out of the tank that would then feed into the oil system. So it's a whole other system. It is not part of that. All right, viscosity index. Yes? So you're saying some older aircraft have the oil dilution system, any newer ones have that? No, not that I'm aware of. We talk newer aircraft. I mean, let's talk about, you know, the, the newer Cessnas, the uh, Cirrus. No, they're not going to do that. So we have modern multi-viscosity oils, um, Red Dragon heaters, uh, block heaters on aircraft. So people who live in colder environments have ways of dealing with this. My airplane came from Wisconsin. It's got a really nice little sleeping bag that goes over the whole cowling. I've never used it. Um, you, then it, it has like an inlet where you hook, hook some sort of blower, hot blower that goes in the engine. Uh, my aircraft engine also had a block heater and cylinder heaters. I took it out and sold it. It's like, I live in California. I don't need that crap. So, it, which is just a heating strip on the oil pan, a heating strip on you know, about that big on the oil pan, and that went on top of the uh, one, one half of the crankcase. And then it had a plug that went into each cylinder. There's a little port on the bottom. Um, and each little plug heated up, and she plugged it into 110. So I guess you need a really long extension cord when you fly, but um, <laughs> it's a joke. You don't plug it. Uh, and so, yeah, I just took it off and sold it. So, all those would have come with STCs too, correct? Yeah. There wasn't one of my aircraft, so we just stuck it on there. I'm like, it's no SDC. Then the problem with that is um, on your cylinders. Not this one, of course, but all modern cylinders have a port right here on the bottom. So depending on which way your engines are, so this would be the bottom. There's a port where you can screw something in. And so if you have the, the engine heater, it's a little thing about yay long that screws into there and it heats up. Well, if you want to put a cylinder head temp probe, that's where it goes. So we got one hole, so you either have a cylinder head temp probe or you're going to have a heater. And then I wanted the probe, so. Why don't you just get the washer type? Or you get the washer type, which I don't want because that's like, those are spark plug temp gauges. I don't want to know what my spark plug temp is. They don't work as well. They run, they show hotter than what it really is. All right, viscosity index. It's a little bit different than just viscosity. Um, it's the measurement of the rate of change of an oil. So if it has a real high viscosity index, the oil does, then the less the viscosity is going to change with temperature. So if I had a straight weight oil like 100, then a real high viscosity index, then when it's really cold, it's going to act like 100. 100. And when it's really hot, it's going to act like 100. 100. Now, if I took a 
you know, that 15W50 and just poured it in and said, hey, what's the viscosity index of this? You would say, it's not very good. When it's cold, it's kind of runny. When it gets hot, it gets pretty thick. So I think that's backwards. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be backwards. Bad example. So if I had 100 weight oil, when it was cold, it was like molasses, which I've never even seen, syrup. And, and, oil. and then when it was hot, it was really runny, but it's supposed to be 100 weight, then that would have a poor viscosity index. It doesn't stay the same. So um, a measure. That's weird because I use zero shell and it seems to do that. Is they all, all going to have that? It does pour much better when it's hot. Wait, all, all of those, yeah. A measure um, of the rate of change See, of the viscosity of the viscosity, let me see. So the higher the index, the less the viscosity changes. I always understood it as that first number was what was the viscosity of, at uh, operating temps versus when it was cold. So no. 1550 was 15 lower viscosity. When it's cold. When it's cold. Lower viscosity is less resistance. It'd be more runny, right? Yes, when it's cold. But at high temperatures. Then it goes to it, the 50. It's a lot more runny. No. Oh, you say it is? It goes the other way around. Okay, so here's, if I can follow what you're saying. Your experience is, you take an oil, and if it's really cold, and you try and pour it, it comes out pretty slow. Pretty slow. Which is true. And you take that same bottle of oil, and you heat it up, sit it on top of the hot engine for a while, then try and pour it, it comes out really fast. That is true. But then we look at the bottle, and it says 15W50. So what does that mean? Well, it means when it's cold, it's 15, and when it's hot, it's 50. See, I thought it was the other way around. It was 50, 50 weight no. at a cold temperature. No, okay. no, nope, it's the other way around because you want it thin and runny when it is cold. But it's confusing because your experience is yeah. that it pours much slower when it's cold no matter what. That is yeah, true. That's what I'm trying to get. I don't yeah, so how does that work? But we can think, okay, let's, let's use uh, Don's analogy, my father-in-law and split it up into two things. One is the rate of pour. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. And the other is the size of the ball bearings. Okay. Hmm. So with multi-grade, we change the size of the ball bearings, but yet its flow rate is based upon heat. So heat will make it flow faster or slower, but in a multi-viscosity, the size of the ball bearings change from 15s to 50s. Okay. How's that? Right You'll like that. No, that's way better to think about. I'm going to tell you about like, it. Holy shit. <laughs> like, what have I been putting in my engine? <laughs> so I don't know necessarily what the viscosity index is of our aviation oils. It's something that you're asked about, so I thought I'd better say it. Uh, the other thing is color. Uh, color is not something I worry too much about. It just, well, no, I take that back. Um, not when it's made. But obviously, uh, color is important. I know when I was in the Navy, one of the things I had to do every morning on this one watch, if you had it, was go around to all the machinery and get a glass b jar of oil. I hope you didn't drop it because it was glass. And you always had to take it and <clears throat> put it excuse me, in uh, a, gla uh, a light box and take a look at the color of all the oil. We look at the color of oil in our cars, right? If you ever check your oil, you pull the dipstick out. <clears throat> And you look, what is it you don't want to see? Black. <coughs> black. Diesel. Yeah, well, if it's diesel, I think I'd want it black. It's not working. Um, yeah, 100,000 miles. Looks like I never went through it. Um, I hate to say the, they. They say, well, who is they? I don't know. Um, we are they. Yeah, we are they. The people on the internet say that uh, don't worry so much about the color of the oil. I don't know. I, I do. Uh, when it starts looking black and nasty, I mean, I want to know. Um, yeah, if it looks foamy, it looks like... You yeah, know. if it's foamy, yeah, if it's... Shiny, shiny. Like, but isn't it... Oh, what, you know, if I, in, in my car, geez, what if, I, what if it looks a little milky brown, like some nasty <laughs> hot chocolate? 
It just means you have the cooling system and the oil system. Yeah, the cooling system means you got water in your oil. Yeah, I want to know all this stuff. So. Isn't it supposed to get darker because the oil has detergents and as it picks up contaminants, it gets... But even right at... Like yes, it's detergent oil. It's supposed to... We call oil detergent oil. There's detergent and non-detergent, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. We don't use that term in aviation, but it, it's what it means. Um, the oil is supposed to pick up contaminants and hang on to it. So when you dump it out and change oil, it takes the contaminants with it. So that's what it's supposed to do. So it should start getting darker. And to some extent, the, how quickly it gets dark is sort of an indication of the ring condition and blow by and stuff like that. But you know, they say, don't worry about it. Is that what Corolla, it's like, I'll change the oil. Like, uh, like after like 500 miles, it looks like pretty dark. And it's like, it's I <laughs> After 500 miles? <laughs> yeah. Bro, don't you have to put like 30 yeah, quarts of oil a week? Two and a half quarts of oil a week. What are you putting in your fucking engine? Uh, the heaviest oil I can find, so it burns less quickly. <laughs> I'm starting to put 70 weight in it. <laughs> oh my god. Try some uh, 100 weight. Yeah, I think I started putting 10, 10 to 40 in it. Smog and it would never start in the winter. It would just have to sit for six months. So uh, <laughs> color. So it's obtained by referencing a transmitted light through a sample of oil. It's just one of the characteristics of oil. It should have a good color. Uh, there's a thing called cloud point, which I think is a little more important for cold weather operations. Uh, the temperature at which, the temp at which, the separation of wax. So now I know there's wax in this stuff. Separation of wax in the oil. And the oil becomes visible and this is usually right above the solidification point <laughs> that sounds really bad So at one point, it's going to become cloudy, oil's going to start separating, and then it becomes solid. Sounds like bad news bears. <laughs> All right, so this uh, kind of speaks to what we talked about a little bit with the pore point. Different type of pore point. My kind of pore point is where my family spends all my money. Uh, the temperature at which oil flows without disturbance. Uh, chemical stability. It resists oxidation. Breaking down. <clears throat> or coking. All very bad things. And a couple more points that it should have. Well, we should have high anti-friction properties, obviously. Or anti-wear. We already mentioned this. Since one of its primary jobs is to keep the engine from wearing out. Uh, we already said this. It needs to have maximum cooling ability and it better be non-corrosive when I was at Lycoming school it was really cool there was a guy in the class there were some really cool people in this class um, they always say that you know if you really want to be somebody you want to better yourself don't be the smartest guy in the room Mission accomplished. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one guy, I think I had mentioned before, um, you ever watch the old-timey films of NASA and stuff, the guy with his little thin black tie with the thing, and he's in charge of everybody. And one of those guys was there, the flight director for NASA. Whoa. Yeah, I know. Um, Why the hell is he like him? <laughs> 
because he was an editor of a magazine and built an RV. So he just wanted to know more about his Lycoming. Uh, and uh, another guy was a, was a chemical engineer working at, at Shell, developing different types of fuels. And uh, he was interesting. He had never worked on it. He's not an A&P, never worked on you know, airplanes. And they just they have a Lycoming in the test cell. And he just wanted to know more about the light combing that he's running as he develops fuel. And it, it was enlightening to hear him, you know, somebody said, well, when are we going to have, you know, this kind of fuel or that? And he's like, the thing you have to understand is whatever you develop has to not only work the way you want it, but it also has to work the way you want it when combined with every conceivable thing a person could put in an aircraft. Like piss? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much, you know. So he's like, he's, you know, imagine that you have this perfect 100 uh, unleaded fuel that is everybody's been waiting for, but yet they find out that if you put a gallon of unleaded from Arco in it, the whole thing breaks down and the engine seizes. You know, that goes back on shell as a liability. So um, you didn't talk about oil, but it's the same thing. You have to think about, you know, this oil because people do weird things, you know, they... You know, I'm low on oil and I want to go flying. Well, I'm just going to stop off at Pet Boys and just pick up some, you know, Mobile One and throw it in. Well, it's got to work with this, you know. So it's all got to be, uh, so it's hard to make this kind of stuff. All right. So let's talk about now aircraft-specific oils. So we have types of oils. I know I kind of said types of oils before, but aircraft oils. And this gets down into what are you going to select? So now we know what kind of oils, you know, what they're made of, what their goal is, what they have to accomplish. They have all this work to do. Uh, but even the things I didn't write go hand in hand in this stuff, which we did talk about. It's got to be a cleaning agent too. It's got to suspend the particles and take them out with. It's got to do all this other stuff. It's got to deal with all the lead in our systems and all the, the weird metals. Uh, one of the things that I do with my aircraft is, and it's common for aircraft owners, is when I change the oil, I take a sample and I send it out for, they call it a soap test, spectral oil analysis program, I think. Um, oil analysis, I just call it. And so they do some sort of analysis on the oil, which shows the breakdown of everything in the oil. There we go. Well, analysis. Let's see, where's my last one? Probably that one. It's Blackstone is who I use. They're really cool. I really enjoy them because they give these nice little things. Kevin, this report is something of a mixed bag. Let's start with the good news. Copper decreased, so bronze, brass parts are settling in nicely. Aluminum chrome went up a little, so maybe the engine may have had some wearing left to do. Even if there is some extra wear, it's early yet to assume any problems, especially if temps are normal and oil combustion is stable consumption and it really is in my plane this was a longer oil run than the last time too so more accumulation is playing a role in metals going up we'll look for progress to start showing up next service that's awesome i actually called and uh talked to the the the, I mean, the lady who wrote this and i was like well thank you i just love your report she goes do you really so um Has i thought that, no i don't think so so um yeah, yeah, it really helps you out. And I've heard of Blackstone actually calling, because they have your number and stuff. I've heard of actually calling people, because it takes a while for this report to be done and stuff. They'll email you the results. I've heard them like call people and say, hey, you, you got a real problem. You need to gr ground your plane right now. We need to talk. They don't just send it out and go, oh, I hope they get this. Uh, but you can see the stuff that's in there. Uh, let's see. It just, for some reason, I'm surprised. I thought there would be, why is it so short? It looks like the same one. Or I think I had him redo something. Yeah, I thought I had more. Well, I also have, um, I run it into spreadsheet, so. Just yeah, see, here we go. I get, there's more in there. So I was trying to get one that had a bunch of values. Let's just look Are at this one. Are each column 
a different time. Yeah, the different date. Different time, different oil. Yeah, and I've, I've had a lot done, so I was wondering why that one just didn't. I put them all here anyway. There, so you can kind of see. You can see my aluminum. So this is the back when I got the plane, when I first started doing this. Actually, no, the 25th. We're all out of freaking order. That's the last one. Okay, so it starts here, goes that way in this one. All right, so aluminum kind of, you know, started at nine, went up. So you have aluminum, I have chromium, iron, copper, lead. Where's all that lead coming from? Fuel. Fuel, yep. What happened with that phosphorus? Tin, where's tin? Um, Probably bearings. Maybe. Uh, nickel, not totally Probably sure. Bearings. Manganese, um, silver, I don't have silver. I don't have silver bearings or titanium, potassium, um, boron, silicon. What's silicon? Gaskets? Dirt. Dirt. Um, sodium. Salt dirt. Uh, probably dirt. Calcium. Dirt. Well, let's check out calcium. What happened here? What's going on? What'd you do? Did you cam guard. I started using cam guard, which is a high high calcium high product too. and phosphorus. Yep. Maybe so. you should give your engines a phosphorus binder. No, no. Zinc. So that's good. That's good or bad. Zinc started off real high and went down. That's good. That's the product I'm putting in it. Yes. Yeah, so. But the, ca the cam guard, the, set, the higher numbers are... Um, That's because of the cam guard in it. And so it's not yeah. That is the cam guard That's stuff. An yeah. It's an additive, yeah. It's the only additive that... So then you could probably put in like, hey, expect calcium to go up... They know. The oh, they, they totally know. Well, they, when you fill this out... Um, why is it now being stupid? Way different than... Um, there. It's like Something is like locking it up. I don't know what's locking it up. It's being an ass. Anyway, there's a fillable form that you have to fill out that um, you put what kind of oil, how much you've added since. Uh, maybe someday I'll be able to show it to you. But anyway, so we have that all that. Uh, okay, so type of aircraft oils. The first thing I want to talk about is straight mineral oil. When you buy oil for your car, it has all kinds of additives and detergents and stuff to clean it and, and whatnot. When you get straight mineral oil for aviation, it is just oil. And I think a little bit of one additive to help pour a pour point suppressant, I think. Um, yeah, I was right. Pour point uh, depressant for improved fluidity at cold temperatures. That is it. So straight mineral oil. Um, Oh, all oil is kind of, no, it's not white. It's, it looks just like oil. If I poured a sample of mineral oil in this cup, uh, car oil in this cup, and a different type of aviation in this cup, and hand, you, you couldn't tell the difference. It's, they're all yellow-ish. They all look the same. So straight mineral oil. So an example would be aeroshell. And these are the two most common that you would use. Aeroshell 80 or AeroShell 100. Just and like that. I, I mentioned the uh, multi-grades there. No, for some reason like that. Oh, the semi-synthetics. But I mentioned semi-synthetics. Those are semi-synthetics. We'll circle around to that. But anyway, here's the the aeroshell product line in straight mineral oil. So I want to, I wanna, it's, it could get confusing if I'm not careful. It's all mineral oil based, what we're using, but there's just straight mineral oil, no additives. Got it? So uh, straight mineral oil, no additives. Where am I out here? Um, um, made from High viscosity index. What does that mean? It means it doesn't change. Doesn't change with heat. VI, viscosity index. Base stocks. That's like the stock oil they get. Uh, contains almost 
no additives. Just a pore point, depressant, maniac, for improved fluidity at cold temps. All right, when do we use straight weight? All right, let me see. when do we use straight mineral oil? That's what I wanted to say. It is used for break in. When you break in an engine, they want you, they being continental and light coming, asterisk, to use a straight mineral oil. but not on turbo engines. And I think only Lycoming says that. Not on turbo charged engines. Because why? Because that, uh, that turbocharger lubricant? Yep. That? Turbo uses, uh, the engine oil. It's the same system. But why do they want you to use no additive? Do they want things to wear in together? And then yes. So, so, then so let me give you my little take on this, but you go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm asking <laughs> questions. It's like, so well then, if they want, if the turbocharged engines don't want you to use that, then they're kind of like, it's kind of like saying, well, it doesn't really matter if we break that engine in. Turbocharger. Yeah, it does. But okay, so let me let me write this point. So mineral oil, mineral oil does not does not suspend particles. Straight mineral oil does not suspend particles and allows sludge to build up. So in some respects, it's like this. Straight mineral oil is not as good as mineral oil with the detergent additives. So you want to break in an engine. So you don't want it to be too slippery. Therefore, you use a shitty oil. Excuse me for saying that. Then once the engine's broke in, go ahead and use a nice oil. Unless you have a turbocharger, which can't handle the crappy oil, then you better use a detergent, a detergent or an ashless dispersant, we'll call it, um, mineral oil with the additives, because the turbocharger really needs it. Well, then are the cylinders going to break in? Yes, of course they will. <laughs> then why am I using this oil? It's what we've always done. So, why, why do we use straight mineral oil to break in? Best answer I have because it's, it's what we've always done. So when I was in the field working on, in, on overhauling engines, and I started working with ECI, which sold out to uh, Continental, and it was a really cool company because you, you worked with a, a smaller company where you talked to the engineers and everybody. You know, It wasn't like this big conglomeration where, I don't know, it's just what we always did. It was this innovative kind of thing. And so they were producing crankshafts and cylinders and and... I use so many of their parts, and their thing was, you buy our cylinders, we want you to break everything in on Philips XC2050. A detergent, not straight mineral oil, multi-grade. It's a really good oil. It's the, we want you to start with that and run it all the way to life with the same oil. And so I became this really big fan, and, and all of my engines I broke in on the Philips, and uh, as far as I know, I had no problems whatsoever. I hesitated because um, you remember at our uh, year end party, the people that came, they gave away the scholarships. Uh, one of the guys there goes, Hey, you used to work out at Clarksburg? I'm like, Yeah. He goes, I saw your name in my logbook. You built my engine. 
Like, no way, that's awesome. How's it doing? He goes, thing didn't last. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, no way. He goes, nope. And I forget what he said. I mean, it kind of ate itself up. And I'm like, I, I'm just like turning white. He goes, oh, no, nope. He goes, not you. He goes, believe it or not, I had brought it to you because it had, it kind of ate itself up. And so I had it overhauled and it did it again. And he said what it was, and we'll talk about this later, the propeller and engine combination was supposed to have been placarded to never run it in a certain range because of harmonic vibrations. And he said, that's where I always ran it, in that range. He goes, I had no idea. And he goes, and after like the third engine failure, I finally started looking into it. And he said, it's, he goes, it was never supposed to be operated within those limits. Wow, he goes, so it wasn't you. Expensive. Yeah. It's a really smart guy, too. And I'm like, wow, that sucks. All right, so mineral oil does not suspend particles and allows sludge to build up. What is sludge? Is that good or bad? bad. Yeah. So there is a note, not that it happens anymore, but uh, use caution when converting an engine. E-N-G-I-N. An engine that has operated on straight mineral for several hundred hours. Because the oil that we would, the normal oil we're going to use is going to break up that sludge and then to start to disperse it. So you have massive amounts of sludge build up in a crankshaft and you suddenly knock it loose, it's going to start plugging stuff up. Yeah. So it's called AD oil. That's the next one we'll talk about. AD oil will loosen, will loosen sludge and potentially block oil passages. So what do you do at that point? Well, what do you do? It's just screwed. No. If ran oil like that, change oil. <laughs> change oil at five hours. So you, you have mineral oil. You're going to switch to AD. You run the oil for five hours. Then every 10 until no SLUD, no sludge is found in filter screen filter or screen you've been in mineral oil for five hours no you've been running mineral oil for 400 hours and now you go oh, i don't want to run mineral oil anymore i want to run ad oil it was, that long? well some people didn't know oh i, I was just I thought honestly you know. where the guy about the guy about my plane from when i mean it had like 200 hours on the engine he goes well here's the oil i'm like it's freaking straight weight what was what they said to use I'm like yeah for break-in so I almost had that problem. So I had to go to, you know, I had to keep an eye on it. But anyway, so you, then you put the new type oil in, go for five hours, drain it, check the screens, throw it out, put in more. It's expensive. But, all right, I kept you a little bit long, sorry.